Hi, my name is Jorge Castillo, and I'm the clinical director of the Waldenstrom's program at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute here in Boston. I've been uh, taking care of patients with Waldenstrom's over the last eight years. And today I'll be happy to talk to you about a little bit about Big Neal syndrome. I know uh, most of you already know about this, but I will be happy to kind of uh, give a few minutes introduction of what this is all about, what treatment options we have available for this type of condition, and obviously, you know, how do we look into this into the future? So for this, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, we're gonna just talk about first how Waldenstrom's manifests itself in you know, many different ways. So with, this is one of the ways that we have uh, to look into all this. Uh, some patients with Waldenstrom's will have no manifestations of the disease at the moment of diagnosis. It will be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. While other patients over time, you know, they might actually become symptomatic or be symptomatic at diagnosis. Uh, as most of you do know, anemia is a very common presentation, hyperviscosity and neuropathy as well, and there are so many other different clinical presentations for patients with Waldenstrom's. But one of the rare presentations is this condition called Big Neal syndrome, which is essentially a condition in which the malignant cells, uh, the Waldenstrom cells, do gain access to the brain and the spine, and they can cause symptoms because of the presence and inflammation and other processes that these malignant cells induce by the presence of these cells in these organs. Now, <clears throat> as you can understand, the manifestations of Big Neal syndrome are also very varied. Um, and depending on where in the brain is located, where in the spine is located. So if it's, uh, the areas are affected more in the, in the lower side of the, of the brain, you know, in, you know, where the cranial nerves are, then patients can have cranial nerve symptoms specifically some facial paralysis, some, some maybe some other areas of the, of the face are being affected or um, the smell or the, the hearing or some things like that. Um, sometimes when the brain has specific areas as well affected either by masses or other problems, then we could potentially have some limbs being affected and some other areas of the body being affected. Some patients can present with seizures and headaches and um, altered mental status, uh, you know, patients get a piece of cell confusion in which patients sometimes they don't know who they are, what, what they are doing or where they are, or what, what they, some things are, you know, useful for. I had a patient that didn't know what a door, doorknob was all about, for example. But there are other patients that can have a bit more subtle symptoms of this, you know, some, just some headaches that don't, do not go away, some specific numbness in specific areas of the face of the body that do not go away, typically more regionalized instead of being bilateral or we're doing that like we see neuropathy for example um, um, and then when the spine is affected also other symptoms can occur you know specifically pain in the lower back or specific pain radiating to specific uh, limb or not related to these diseases so the, how do we investigate these conditions so number one we need to suspect it you know about about one percent of all the patients that we see in our clinic might have this condition of Neal syndrome, but we need to suspect it so we can actually diagnose it appropriately. So once we have a suspicion, clinical suspicion that this could happen, we usually order two different tests. The first test is an MRI of the brain and the spine. MRIs tend to be better than CAT scans, specifically because we're looking for, uh, sometimes we do see masses, which the CAT scan can show, but in most cases, it's not masses. In most cases, it's just this very superficial inflammation of the lining of the brain. Uh, and the, the CAT scans are not as good as the MRIs for that specific, we call it meningeal enhancement, this abnormal enhancement. So MRIs need to be done with gadolinium. Gadolinium is what will provide that additional enhancement that is necessary to be to visualize these abnormal areas of the brain and the spine. And I will show you some pictures in a minute. So. That's the first step. Now, over 90% of patients with Big Neal syndrome will have abnormalities in the MRI, uh, but about 10% might not have any abnormalities in the MRI, and that becomes, makes it a bit more challenging. That's when we need to have a second step. Regardless if the MRI is positive or not, we always have to take some spinal fluid test, you know, spinal fluid from the patients. We do that through a spinal tap, and we obtain uh, amount of fluid. And we send this fluid to be uh, evaluated for the presence of malignant cells that, you know, the profile of those cells should match the profile of the malignant cells in the marrow. Uh, sometimes we do send for NYD88 mutations. We send for IgH gene rearrangements. In, in a way, we, what we're trying to do is matching those cells with the cells in the marrow. And 
in, to make the proper diagnosis, those cells would need to match, right? The cells that are in the marrow should be the same cells that are in the brain or in the spinal fluid. So in that way, we make a formal diagnosis. Now, we do have a very small group of people uh, with very likely uh, big Neil syndrome that MRIs are negative, in whom MRIs are negative, and also spinal fluids are negative. But we believe the patient might have big Neil syndrome regardless because of the symptoms or other findings. Those patients obviously do not have confirmed big Neil syndrome, but they can have probable or possible big Neil syndrome. And we need to make need to understand that that is also a possibility. So that's the way we actually make a proper diagnosis. In most cases, the patients are symptomatic enough that we need to treat. But in some cases, we don't. We do have a handful of people with big Neil syndrome who had initial symptoms, and that's what prompted the testing. But then the symptoms did resolve, and the patients are essentially asymptomatic. So the sole pre diagnosis of big Neil syndrome should not mean the patient need to be treated if the symptoms are minor or, or negligible or, or non. Um, so if the patient has big Neil syndrome and the symptoms are affecting the patient's activities of the daily living, that's when we proceed to treat. Now, there are multiple treatment options that we have been using over the, over the, last, over the several, last several years. Um, what we need to understand is that for Waldenstrom, we have multiple treatment options. And the same treatment options that we use for Waldenstrom's can be applied for big Neil syndrome. The issue is not every treatment for Waldenstrom's crosses into the brain or the spinal tissue. And that's where the problem comes and that decreases the number of options that we have available. So classically, we have had chemotherapeutic agents crossing into the blood brain barrier. And for that, we have methotrexate, which is a classic one. Cytarabine is another one that we use, fludarabine, and there's some data with bendamustine, which is kind of plus or minus, but has been used in this specific setting. So those are the, the options. Rituximab doesn't cross, ofatumumab doesn't cross, uh, cyclophosphamide doesn't cross, bortezomib, carfilzomib, xasomib, they do not cross into the blood brain barrier. So as you can see, many treatments that we use for patients with Waldenstrom's cannot apply in patients with big Neal syndrome just because these medications do not cross into the brain. Now, uh, more recently, uh, we do have data uh, with uh, the newer treatment options, specifically ibrutinib, BTK inhibitors. Ibrutinib, uh, we did a study in which we actually showed that ibrutinib penetrates into the spinal fluid, and that can be seen in many other conditions too. Um, so specifically for, for patients with VNL syndrome, that initial uh, um, finding led us to you know, start using ibrutinib in patients with Waldenstrom saying with VNL syndrome. Ibrutinib is highly effective in patients with Waldenstrom. We have patients, over 90, 95% of patients do respond, and those patients have durable responses. I'm talking about Waldenstrom specifically. Um, and so we started using ibrutinib uh, as a treatment for patients with big Neal syndrome. And this uh, experience was published in blood a couple of years ago, and we actually put 20, 28 patients on this study. I think about half of the patients were from Dana-Farber, and the remainder were from other centers in the United States and Europe. So interestingly enough, what we focused on was in symptomatic improvement, radiologic improvement, that means the MRIs, and cytologic improvement, that means the spinal fluid. At three months, we see that the majority of patients had an improvement in the, in the symptoms as well as the uh, MRIs with some improvement into the spinal fluid burden of disease. When we do get to at the six months with something very similar, and at 12 months, even a higher proportion of patients were benefiting from these treatments. When we look at the entire population of 28 patients, about 85% um, of patients did have either improvement or resolution of the symptoms that initially prompted the diagnosis of Big Neal syndrome. This is with ibrutinib single agent without any additional treatments. When we looked at the MRIs, about 85% again had either resolution or improvement of the radiologic symptoms. So these are outstanding outcomes. But when we look at the spinal fluid component of this, only half of the patients had clearance of the spinal fluid, what the other half did not. At the beginning, this could be problematic because when we treat patients with a more aggressive uh, primary brain lymphomas, the goal of the treatment is to clear the spinal fluid. That's how we measure the efficacy of the treatment. But in a condition like Waldenstrom's in, in Big Neal syndrome, in, in, in which these are not aggressive conditions and there are incurable conditions, I think it is okay uh, that the spinal fluid still has malignant cells in there. When we treat patients with Waldenstrom's, there's still malignant cells in the bone marrow, and that doesn't mean the medication is not working. So as long as the patient has improvement and resolution of the symptoms, 
as long as the patients have improvement in resolution of the MRI findings, regardless if there's half of the patients with still evidence of spinal fluid disease, I think that ibrutinib is a medication that actually works in these patients. And when we look at the survival of these patients over time, you know, this is 28 patients. Most of the patients were seen between one and two years of the treatment, but the large majority of these patients were still alive, you know, so many years of our treatment. Now, this was a, a publication more than two years ago. Uh, we're working on an updated, uh, higher, uh, larger sample of patients. But at, in this study, about two years, we had about 75% survival rate, which is an outstanding outcome compared to what we have seen previously with other treatments. Now, as you all know, ibrutinib is approved by the FDA for the treatment of patients with Waldenstrom's, and also sanobrutinib was recently approved for patients with Waldenstrom. This is a study in which one patient with Big Neal syndrome uh, in Australia was treated with sanobrutinib, and we can see the MRI just to show you here. There's a bit of inflammation in the cervical area. You can see this discoloration on the before aspect of things, and a bit more in the thoracic part as well. A bit of discoloration on the on the um, spinal cord, and after treatment with xanobrutin, I think it's about six months into it, really there's uh, no, not a complete resolution, but a much, much, much more improvement in terms of the inflammation in both locations as well. There was another area of the lower spine as well that I didn't put here, but also there was improvement in there too. The patient uh, has been on xanobrutin already close to a year and continues doing very well. So I think the BTK inhibitors in general terms do penetrate into the spinal fluid, we don't have a lot of data with acalabrutinib, but I know our colleagues in the brain lymphoma group here are using now also acalabrutinib in that setting, uh, but we don't have any data on big meal syndrome. But I do believe all the BTK inhibitors do penetrate into the spinal fluid. So in our clinic, BTK inhibitors have become the standard of care for patients with big meal syndrome. And only if the, if the patients progress or, or, or do not tolerate BTK inhibitors, then we move into treating these patients with chemotherapy. There is some data uh, that maybe venetoclax, uh, a new medication that might be coming up for patients with Waldenstrom's can also penetrate into the spinal fluid. So maybe that's another treatment option for patients in the future. Um, and I, I think the, the clinical trials are very rare in patients with venial syndrome. We're trying to come up with a clinical trial uh, in, the, in patients with venial syndrome, but it's, it's difficult because the number of patients is very limited. But we will try at least to have some prospective uh, you know, idea of how these medications might work in these scenarios. So I, I think that's the message that I have uh, today. We have better treatments. Uh, I think the patients with being ill syndrome are surviving longer than previously uh, because of these treatments precisely. And I think the future you know, uh, looks very promising as we treat more patients with Waldenstrom with conditions, with treatments that penetrate into the spinal fluid then we can actually come up with better treatments for patients with pain syndrome as well. With that, thank you for your attention.